five seconds to tell you, but I won't. Here we go. Okay, good morning. As Mike prayed, and as I want to affirm this morning, we are here because of the faithfulness of the triune God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of His Word, the love of Jesus Christ, the blessings, the mercy that each one of us has been given. I'm just so excited to be here this morning and ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We're in it, and we're going to be in it for a little while. And today I have, I just want to tell you at the, uh, at the front of this, a lot of Scripture. And I began to think this week, why am I picking large chunks of Scripture to read? Well, because I think it's good to get the backstory of the highlight of these heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. So when the writer of Hebrews talks about Abraham, talks about Sarah, talks about Isaac, uh, Jacob, and Joseph, as we'll read today, there's a backstory with that. There's the history of God's faithfulness in their life. And I'm here to affirm today that these people had faith in God's promises and they couldn't see the end result of those promises. Some of it, as we've looked at, remember we've talked about Abraham, he fell into a a, a deep sleep and had this really traumatic, dark dream and fear descending over him as he was witness to God's prophetic revelation to him that his descendants, although numerous and, and, and just a sign in themselves of the miraculous power of God, would go through years of enslavement. Not everything God shows his people or his prophets is pleasant. And Randy Smith talked about that last week, didn't he? About some of the things that Zechariah had to tell the nation of Israel. But we all joyfully say thank you to God because what he says does come true. Amen? So as we've also shared in context this morning, Hebrews is a book for the last days. We are in dark times. We are in crazy times. We are in times of absolute, just a growing lawlessness and lovelessness. We are in at times of great apostasy in the church. I will have to say my concerns are really specific this week for the Conference of the Grace Brethren Churches, of whom I was formerly a part, because of some of the speakers that they have. And the Youth Conference, which has been going on this week, because of some of the speakers they have been featuring. Today's sermon is not about that, but it is about the fact that no matter what the climate is, which right now is one of darkness and growing wickedness, there is still joy to be had in the beautiful fact that our God is faithful in His promises. Amen? I don't care, once again, who's in the White House. I care about who's on the throne, and it's God. And I'm not going to worry, and I'm not going to lose myself and go crazy in these last days for fear and anxiety and stress over things that I cannot change. But I'm going to cling ever so tightly to Jesus, and I want to walk in the faith of these patriarchs. How about you? Amen? In faith died these all, we are told in Hebrews 11, not seeing the end of these promises, but that's the beauty of faith. We trust in what we can't see. And instead of that being a, a, a deal killer for a lot of people, well, if I, can't, if I can't figure it out with my intellect, then it just doesn't exist to me. It's not reality. Well, listen, wake up. Your intellect is fallible, limited, and passing away. Amen? Faith and faith that endures is faith that is tested. Faith that is based on the promises of God and His past faithfulness. And faith that trusts with all abandon everything that God has said will come to pass. Whether or not we agree or like it or find it preferable to us. Amen? God is working. God is moving. And nothing will thwart His plans. We see that today in today's passage. Look with me at Hebrews 11, starting in uh, verse 20. But we've talked about Abraham for quite a long time because after all, he is Father Abraham. He's Abraham Avino. He's Abraham, our father, if we have the faith. Well, these three men that we're going to read about today, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, two of them, if you want to do a subtitle of the sermon today, it would be Faith of Our Fathers, Part 5, the faith of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But also you could say about two of them at least, Faith at Death's Door. Because the writer of Hebrews makes it very specific that two of these men, in two of these episodes, as they were dying, this is what they said. Or this is what they did, piste in the Greek, by faith. 
Now that's exciting to me. Because it's one thing to start well, but it's another, isn't it, to finish well. And how many of us want to finish well? Amen. We don't want to be like Demas. Remember Paul said, Demas stood with me in the beginning, man. He was a, he was a partner of mine. He was, a, he was, a, he was a, a comrade here in the ministry. And then by the end, he's loved this present world. He's forsaken me along with everyone else, Paul says. See, a lot of people start okay, and then somewhere along the line, they blow it. They lose faith. And I don't want anybody in here to, to be the, in that boat. I want us all to be able to say at the end, even by faith as we're dying, we are doing what God wants us to do as they were dying. Look at verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 11. And I promise you, one last reference as to why we're going to a lot of scripture today is because a lot of people are not going to a lot of scripture today. Amen? This is a reaction Pardon me for being a little reactionary, but this week I've had a number of people tell me, listen, all we hear at our church are stories. All we hear at our church are jokes. And folks, you do not want me to start telling jokes. And that was a joke. But verse 20, verse 20, that was horrible. See how I did that there? By faith, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. Let's talk about old father Isaac here for a moment at the beginning. By faith, it says Isaac blessed. And in the Greek here, it's the eulogesin, what we get our word eulogy from. It's saying something, by the way, at its, at its bare bones, it is to confer upon somebody in a, another generation what is beneficial, the blessings of God. And we don't have time to go all into it right now, but suffice it to say, when these old men blessed their sons and their grandsons, in many cases, there was something powerful that was passed on to those other generations. Amen? Now, some of you may not have seen, but as we were praying up here, I had my hand on my little daughter's head. And do you know what I was doing? In the name of Jesus, I'm blessing her. I'm saying, listen to this prayer, little girl. Witness the prayers of the saints here for you. Uh, remember and recall to mind what you did a few weeks ago and what you did a year before that when you prayed to Jesus Christ in your childlike faith to believe in him and embrace him for your salvation. And you know what? I'm going to, every day of my life, I'm going to be praying that blessings fall upon my child. Amen? But here's the thing, and maybe this is an Old Testament thing, a little bit more than it is for us, or maybe it's for the Hebrews a little more than, than what we practice or think about, but I want to I just believe here that as, as Isaac blessed someone, as Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in this case, what he said stuck. One commentator said it was like shooting an arrow. You can't really take that back. Once it's left the bow, it's headed for where it's going to head, and it will stick, and a blessing would stick. Can I also say here in the Old Testament, there are examples of where a curse will also stick. But Isaac blessed them. He eulogized them. And this was a spoken blessing that cannot be taken back. And we know the story, and we're going to actually look at it here in a moment. Turn with me to Genesis 27. Bereshit, the book of beginnings. We're in there a lot, aren't we? Some of you are going, maybe too much. And I want to say, you can't be in Genesis too much. It's great, the book of beginnings. Travel with me, if you will, to 1,929 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. We are in Genesis 27. And oh, what a story. It says in Hebrews 11:20 that he blessed his children, Jacob and Esau, concerning things to come or what is about to happen. Thayer says, in general, what is sure to happen? So what Isaac does here when he blesses Jacob and Esau is true, and it has been proven true, and it will continue to be its, into its ultimate fulfillment. This blessing is still out there because it's God's power that is sustaining and upholding his holy word that was spoken here. And inspired scripture tells us the story, doesn't it, of Jacob's deception. First of all, how many of you just think Jacob is one of the greatest examples for our young people in the world today <laughs> in his life? And the answer would be no, right down to his name, Jacob, or heel catcher, or supplanter, one who undermines in a bad way. And we know even from birth, right, Esau comes out first, hairy and red, which has something to do with his name. And then there's this little hand grabbed onto the heel 
of his brother, isn't it? You're not coming out before me. It's my turn. I don't know what it was. I don't know what the motivation was. But even from the womb, there was the symbol of heel catching, thus the name Jacob or Jacob. But look here. We know the story. Rebecca brings Jacob over and says, listen, your father can't see too good. And Esau's out there hunting for him. So if you put on some of Esau's garments and this fur on your, on your arms, when you kneel down to get that blessing, which is so important, when he reaches out and places his hand upon you, he's going to believe what? That you are the firstborn. And that's the blessing you want, right? That's the priority there. I need that first blessing, the first prophetic utterance as my father is in his old age. He's ready to confer this blessing. He's ready for this, this powerful thing that God honors to, to start and that the cycle to begin again or, or whatever's going on there, right? He's going to think you're Esau so you can steal the blessing. He's already stole the birthright, huh? What a supplanter. We know what happens. Jacob described, or d disguised, excuse me, as his brother Esau comes there. Verse 26 says of Genesis uh, 27, Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. You can see the picture, right? Old bearded gentleman laying there. Hey, come on, get it right. Come closer. Verse 27, So he came close and he kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, That's Esau. That's my son. He said, see, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Fresh outdoorsy, I imagine. Now may God, verse 28, give you, all, give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. Man, that's what you want to hear from Pops. Amen? The power and strength of the Lord, that was conferred to the wrong kid. Amen? Is that right? It came about, verse 30, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father, and he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. Isaac his father said to him, who are you? Which is not what you want your aging, nearly blinded father to say. When you've just been out hunting for him. And he said, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Uh-oh. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who is he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. And then he said, is he not rightly named, what? Heel catcher? For he has Jacobed me. That's what he's saying. He's named the supplanter and he has done that. He has supplanted me these two times. Fool me once, right? Wow, what a misery. He took away my birthright, which we know the story there. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Folks, I want to confess to you this morning, I don't know how this works. I don't know what, what you know, what, well, let me see if I can find something, son. I don't know how that works. But there's something super powerful and, and untake backable about it. You can't retract it. You can't undo the blessing. You can't say, well, now that the real guy's here, uh, you know, you're in trouble and you're getting the blessing that I gave to him. You can't do it. You can't transfer it. He says, don't you have anything reserved for me verse 37 but Isaac replied to Esau behold I have made him your master oh and all his relatives I have given to him as servants and with grain and new wine I have sustained him now as for you then what can I do my son Esau said to his father do you have only one blessing my father bless me even me also O oh my father so Esau lifted up his voice and wept Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. Thanks a lot, Dad. That's not what I had in mind. By your sword you shall live. You'll be a violent man. Your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about 
that when you become restless, that you will break his yoke from your neck. Now, we, we have to stop here just for a moment. The truth, and this upholds God's faithfulness, is that Edom, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, were subjugated to the Hebrews during David's time. And you can read the rest of this in 1 Kings 11, but later they revolted under Solomon and what? Broke the neck, I mean, excuse me, broke the yoke from off their neck. You understand that? Another neat little prophecy here. See, remember, prophecy is not merely prediction and then fulfillment. It is a pattern. If we read it in a Jewish way, Jacob Prash is teaching on this, by the way, on a, on a, on a ser series called The Apocalypse on YouTube. You need to watch it. Seven sessions, and he's bringing it, man. But he talks about this understanding of Jewish prophecy, that it is a recapitulating pattern that repeats itself in multiple fulfillments until the ultimate. Now, here's the deal. Again, this prophecy seems to be fulfilled, according to some writers, in the person of King Herod, the evil, wicked king. Anybody know why? Because Herod was an Idumean or an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau, and what did he do? He became ruler for a time over Jacob's descendants, the Jews. So was the yoke broken? Yes, was there a revolt and there's a, is a the coming out from under the subjugation of your brother who wrongfully uh, got that blessing? But he, Yes, but here's what we're saying. God is in control. God gives and God takes away. God exalts and God brings down. God says and he says, here's my word and it's going to go forth and it's going to accomplish what I said it would. And God, by the way, has the Jewish people in the apple of his eye and no world power. No line of descent. No collective gathering of armies or nations is going to thwart God's plan for Israel in the ultimate sense. We'll look at that at the end. But here it begins. And then, of course, we read the rest on your own about Esau bearing this grudge against Jacob, and rightfully so if you're going to look through the eyes of this. Well, Isaac dies at 180. You can read about that in Genesis 35, 27 through 29. And 60 years later, go back with me to Hebrews 11, we read about the second character. Obviously, I'm giving a survey this morning of all of these men and these episodes. But there it is. By faith, Isaac blessed Esau and Jacob. And there's just so much that has come from that and continues to be in effect from these things. The next verse we'll look at is verse 21. In, one, in 1859 B.C., 60 years after Isaac blessed we get the next uh, hero of faith here written about in the book of Hebrews verse 21 of Hebrews 11 by faith Jacob as he was dying ah, time for the supplanter to stand before God amen but as he was dying nonetheless by faith he's faithful by the time we get to Hebrews 11 Yes, all of those things are, 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 are pockmarks and scars on Jacob's life as we read his history and some of the things he did that was not right. But how many of us, if the annals of our life were written down and recorded and many pe people read them generations later, what would you have to sit there and go, wow, that was a rough spot. I really should not have, that, that was bad. Not a good example, but Jacob here by the end, by faith, Jacob, when he's dying, Here's the uh, death's door thing here. Blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. Now please go with me to Genesis 46. As you're turning there, keep in mind, this story is very interesting and it is intricate. And we are going to read some of the details. But Jacob goes on and uh, does the adventures and the things that we know him for, times he's trusting God. And in the end of his life, it says he worshipped on his knees or prostrated or went to the ground, literally is what the word worshipped means there, which is really hard to do if you're, what, leaning on your staff or, as some have translated, he's in his bed at this point. But first we have to read this. In 1875 B.C., this is true, Genesis 46, verse 1 through 7. So Israel, that's Jacob, set out with all that he had had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. 
God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took their livestock and their property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. And in 1875 B.C., this big caravan of Jacob and his family go down to Egypt. Keep in mind, they are in the center of God's will here. This is what God wanted to happen. What God wants to happen will happen. So he's bringing him, he's relocating him, and yet it is exactly according to plan, according to God's plan. Look at chapter 47. We got another little chunk here. Jacob's family settles in the area of Goshen, there in the land of Egypt. Verse 27 through 31. <clears throat> Now Israel, that's Jacob, lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it, and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph, and he said to him, Please, if I've found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Folks, a little strange there. But they're striking a deal. And that's what they did. Amen? He says, please do not bury me in Egypt. For when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. He said, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel, here, here it is now, bowed in worship at the head of the bed. Now commentators say that the leaning upon the staff, as mentioned in Hebrews 11.21, could possibly be translated, though, also at the head of his bed. Here's the point. Here he is at the end of his life, and Jacob, at death's door, is faithful. That's the very profound and simple lesson of this story at this point. He's worshiping the right God at the end of his life. He's leaning there at the end of his bed in worship, and then he, what, begins to bless Joseph's sons now those are his grandsons and we we kind of know the story but go with me to the next chapter i told you we're going to go to a couple passages this morning and we're going to make it <clears throat> joseph sold into slavery becomes exalted in egypt by faith in the true god prepares and provides for others during famine he's now the pharaoh's right hand man so again at pharaoh's command and provision he moves jacob and his whole family down to egypt and then the blessing here at the end of Jacob's life. Keep this in mind this morning because you want to finish well. This is the faith of Jacob. Watch what he blesses uh, his grandsons with. Look at verses 8 through 22. We're going to skip a few there. But when Israel saw Joseph's sons, that's his grandsons, he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, These are my sons whom God has given me here. So he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were so dim from age that he could not see. And then Joseph brought them close to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. You can see doing that to your precious grandkids, am I right? Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face, and behold, God has let me see your children as well. Then Joseph took them from his knees and bowed with his face to the ground. Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand toward Israel's left and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right and brought them close to him. Here's my two uh, oldest sons. I'm going to bring them to you in order at which your right hand is to be placed on the eldest as the firstborn and your left is on what? The secondborn. The first is always the most important because this blessing thing is really powerful. And it's really essential. And so he brings them to his, 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 his uh, you know, nearly blind father. And he says, here's my two grandkids. Verse 14, but Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it, what? On the head of Ephraim, who was the younger. And his left hand on Manasseh's head. See what he's doing? Crossing his hand. 
Although Manasseh was the firstborn, he gets the left hand. The secondborn gets the what? The right hand. You see how that worked? Isn't that interesting? The guy can hardly see. But he did it by faith. He blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, and the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, isn't that a great testimony? And the angel who, who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and may, ma may my name live on in them, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. And he grasped his father's right hand, to his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. Put it on Manasseh's. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. I know what I'm doing here. He also will become a people, and he also will be great. However, this younger brother shall be greater than he. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Folks, what's really going on here? Is the old man losing it? No, God's doing what he has already planned to do. And it will happen irregardless of any circumstance or anything done in the flesh to try to thwart or change anything. God will make sure that his promises will be fulfilled the way that he always knew that they would be. Amen? In your life right now, if I could bring a really quick application, those things that you are going through right now that are causing you to lose sleep, that are causing your stomach to be upset, that are causing you to sweat and wring your hands, and when we watch the TV, we're all in the same boat when we see it. Guess what? God is sovereign over all of those things. God ain't nervous. God's not sweating it. In fact, when the enemies of God gather in a mass to try to defeat him, what does he do? He laughs in derision at them. Amen? That's who you want to follow. But pastor, what about ISIS? What about ISIS? Amen? Compared to the power of the God who created those people and could take them out by saying, molecules dispersed, Pfft, ISIS is jelly. He could do it. We want ISIS to repent and be saved. We want the guy who gunned down our troops the other day to have found Jesus in the car on his way to that place. Even if it was the last minute, wouldn't that have changed everything? But you know what? God still knows exactly what's going to happen. He knew exactly what the outcome of that would be. And the pain and suffering of those families this morning, let's just spotlight that for a moment. Please put it in the hands of the Father who will help you through no matter what circumstances befall you. There are some of us in here that are facing things that we are just absolutely floored by, even the thought of, and God goes, I'll be there. I'm already there. I'm working a work in these days that will accomplish my will. There's the blessing. It's great, right? Verse 20, he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. That will be a blessing that the people would repeat for generations. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. I give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. Listen, godly Jacob, dying, blesses his grandsons. Making, by the way, equal, the Ephraim and Manasseh now become equal to his eldest, Reuben and Simeon. And this also explains Joshua 17 through 18, if you want to read that on your own. The house of Joseph, that tribe, would always be divided into the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. Blessings on both sides, but the blessing that God wanted to befall fell on Ephraim. There's the primary blessing of the firstborn. And, and Jacob dies a good death. Are these the words that are going to be on your lips to those gathered around you on your dying day if the Lord tarries? Are you going to point people to the true God and his son Jesus? And are you going to be able to pronounce to your own kids or grandkids or your friends, or your family or your church family or anybody precious in this life or even your unbelieving friends and family, listen, Jesus is my hope and my portion and the blessing of the grace and mercy of God. Amen? There's the legacy we need to leave. 
And there's the example of faith. Go with me back to Hebrews 11, verse 22. I know we're racing through this in a lot of details. Um, I just got real excited this week. I'm sorry. <laughs> when, I, when I read it, and, I, and again, I had people telling me, listen, man, uh, we don't read the Bible in our church too much. Wow, what do you do, right? This is good stuff. This is real. This is what God wants us to know this morning. Hebrews 11, 22. Also, 1,859 years before Jesus, Joseph and the Exodus. That's the final part here in, this, in, the, in the Faith of Our Fathers series. And we are going to finish it here in the next five minutes. Look at verse 22 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. He tells them essentially, you're going to leave Egypt and I want you to drag my bones with you when you get out of his place. Amen? Why is that a statement of faith? Because 400 plus years later, in 1446 B.C., they transport his bones out of Egypt and it's during a wonderful episode of Jewish history and God's faithfulness called the Exodus. Amen? But keep in mind, he's already telling him as he's dying. He tells the sons of Israel, he says, you guys are going to be leaving Egypt. But he doesn't tell them all the details of what is going to happen. We know the story, don't we? Another pharaoh arises. Probably a pharaoh during the 19th dynasty. Seti I or Ramesses II, if you're into Egypt history. I was kind of looking at some of that this week, and I thought, you know, that's a little bit mind-boggling uh, for, for, for me to figure out which pharaoh it was. Doesn't matter. It's the one that didn't recognize Joseph. Amen? And we know what happened after that. 430 years of what? Hard labor and stripes on the back. Beating and being crushed under the monstrous god king, whichever pharaoh it was, who got a real lesson given to him, didn't he? By the true God. Nonetheless, Joseph sees all this before it's going to happen by faith, and he says, carry my bones out of here. Go with me to Exodus 13. We're almost finished here this morning. Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. We're going to read that chunk. We're skipping another passage, which is Genesis 50, verse 22 to 26, because that's where Joseph tells them, I want you to take my bones out of here. And then it says he was embalmed like a mummy. After all, he was second hand to second uh, position there to the Pharaoh, and that's how they did their burying. <clears throat> so in Exodus 13, beginning in verse 17, it says this. Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, listen to this as we close this morning, Almost closed this morning. God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. And they set out from Sukkoth and camped and eat them on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Joshua 24, 32 says that in 1375 B.C., that's the time that they, uh, historians give it, Joshua dies and his bones are finally buried in the land. A, uh, yeah, jo well, Joshua dies and then Joseph's bones are finally laid to rest in the land that he requested. What is the point? A finality, a good finish. God caused these men to prophesy these things, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, to their descendants, and God fulfilled these things to the letter. Amen? And the scriptures tell us that. The scriptures 
Tell us and show us the place where these things occurred and where God's word was finalized in those prophecies. And I want to round it all up to a statement that we've been reading over and over in Hebrews 11, by faith. It takes true, believing, saving faith to place your trust in God to say the things these men did, to act the way that they did, and to eventually end up here in these recorded chronicles of faithfulness as as demonstrated by the people of God, but really every single part of it points to God because He is the faithful one. Amen? In the midst of our unfaithfulness, where we are faithless, He is always faithful. And his agenda will be accomplished, and we need to trust him because I'll tell you now, from my limited experience on this earth, ain't nothing else going to pan out like what God has said is going to pan out. Amen? Oh, but Trump might be our next president. No, it's not going to do it, man. Oh, but a one-world currency, certainly that'll solve everything, along with a leader that, hey, we can't deny it. No, no. Oh, well, if the temple could be built and the ashes of the red heifer, there it is. Wait a minute. Without the Messiah, without the Messiah, without belief and faith in Yeshua as Mashiach, there's no hope for the Jews who are going to trust in anything else either. Do you rejoice along with me that the Temple Institute is posting all of this good news about the, 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 the coming uh, possibility of getting this cornerstone laid and, and, and all the things in place to, to begin the Temple? Yes, but who are they looking for? By and large, who are they awaiting? The false Christ. But the rejoicing I have is that there will be many Jews who will come to faith, and that's what I wanted to close on with a few passages I want to close this section of Hebrews 11 by going to several other passages. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 19. And I appreciate all of you for being willing to uh, turn to these passages, to look at these glorious truths, and don't let them get old for you. And I'm kind of bringing these out in case you haven't heard it. And I got friends online who said that they were going to watch and say, you know, uh, essentially some people have said, you know, what's it like to, to, to be in a church where you can preach the gospel and the word of God all the time? And so let's read scripture. Amen. Read along with me in uh, Isaiah chapter 19. Starting in verse 16. There's good stuff before that. Go read it. But remember, here's God saying uh, at a portion here in that day, the Egyptians will become like women and they will tremble. And be in dread because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he is going to wave over them. The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which he is purposing against them. And I am in the wrong passage. (laughs) No, I'm not. What am I talking about? Look at verse 19. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors. He will send them a savior and a champion and he will deliver them. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offering and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing. So they will return to the Lord. He will respond to them and will heal them. In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt my people and Assyria the work of my hands and Israel my inheritance. That's why I chose this passage because God's plans for all of these other peoples as well as the Jewish people are going to happen. Do we believe this morning by faith that even that could happen? It will because the entire weight and testimony of scripture of what he's already shown himself faithful in the life of all of these guys we're reading in Hebrews 11 guarantees that he will do what he is going to do with the nations. That's why we read that. 
You can go on your own to Ezekiel 20, verse 33 through 44. Ezekiel 36, 1 through 37, 28. Go with me to Zechariah 12. We've got two more little uh, passages to read here as just an encouragement for us that God is going to accomplish his purposes. Verses 10 through 14. We know this one. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadra Drimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi and the Shimeites, all the families that remain, verse 14, every family by itself and their wives by themselves. God will bring about repentance to the nation of Israel, even though at this time, as they're regathering to the land, we have said oft before, it is for the purpose of judgment. It is for them to be broken. And the sad part is that during the time of tribulation, two-thirds of Israel will die. But what of the one-third that remains, that is being spoken of here, the one-third that repents, the nation, as they look to the sky at the return, the blazing return of their champion and of their Savior and their true Messiah, and they call out for him to rend the heavens and come down. We repent. We're all wicked. We're sorry. We trusted in that which could not save. We trusted in a false treaty. We, we, we turned our backs on the true Christ in pursuit of an antichrist. Save us. We acknowledge now that Yeshua is Hamashiach. Please, we repent. Come rescue us. And he's going to do it. They're going to do it in, peer, in tears. So the last verse, very famous one, Romans chapter 11. And then we'll say amen as we pray. Verses 25 through 27. Paul says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Folks, who is responsible for the partial hardening? God. Who is responsible for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in? Who is responsible for what's happening in the nations today and what, and, and what occurs on a daily basis everywhere all over the world? Who holds tomorrow in his hand? Who held yesterday in his hand? Who walks with us in the presence? Who is coming to rescue us in the future? Who is going to redeem his people Israel? It's God. Verse 26, glorious, and so all Israel will be saved. And that, by the way, is all of Israel that is alive during the time of his second coming. Many, many Jews will not receive Jesus. That's why it's important for us to be involved in Jewish evangelism. It's important for us to cultivate a love for the Jewish people in Israel and realize that they need their Messiah. We've got to pray for them. We've got to preach the gospel to them. But one day God's ultimate fulfillment, and I bring this to tie it all in here. Because these heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 that we've looked at are the fathers. Amen? The patriarchs. Well, we're going to get into Moses, and that's a mind-blowing collection of God's mighty acts. We all know it, and we'll look at it, and we'll celebrate it. But that kind of concludes the section of Hebrews 11 that is the faith of our fathers in, in that respect. And it ends with all Israel being saved someday. Again, as we understand the context, just as is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. My friends, that is the invitation to our Jewish friends if you're watching. The only removal of your sin can happen by trusting in the sacrifice of Yeshua by trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is our ultimate high priest and the ultimate sacrifice. And listen, turn from your sins and embrace his sacrifice. He is your Messiah. He is the anointed one that you need to worship and the one who invited you to do so and calls all men to repent. If you're not a Jew and you're watching this this morning, I don't care what nation you're from, you're in need of Jesus. 
you are in dire, desperate, perilous situation if you don't have Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. So please consider His love for you and God's love demonstrated towards you in that while you were yet a sinner, and if you are right now watching this and you are an enemy of God, you can only be reconciled to Him because Jesus died for you in your place while you are an enemy of God. He wants to make peace, and He's done that on the cross. Amen? Accept Him today. Cry out to Him today. Ask for forgiveness of your sins and embrace Him as your Lord, Savior, and God. And I promise you, you will be recipients of the blessings that can come from an ultimately, supremely faithful God who accomplishes what He prophesies or has us prophesy for Him to do. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your Word this morning. Lord, we looked at passages, and again, in a whirlwind fashion, I am aware of that. But I believe and pray that the refrain by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith is what is going to be ringing in our hearts and ears this week. That we look at these examples and realize they are not just fictitious characters or mythical uh, occurrences. Even though the world would like to paint the Bible as nothing but myths and fables, we know the reality that these were true men and true women who really lived in real time and history and trusted you, the holy, omnipotent, all-knowing God. We thank you for your faithfulness this morning. We thank you that there has never been a time in our life that we can look back on, and even if it was fraught with calamity or bad medical news or, 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 or difficult procedures or conflicts, Lord, there's never been a time when you've abandoned us. And we as your people this morning say thank you and we want to live out the rest of the days you have allotted for us. We know, let, help us to know the measure and the span of our life and, and our days. This, this thing is a vapor, but yet we can be faithful in the vapor. And we can accomplish those things you have for us. And of course, in the end, may we say of our life like these men, even in their old age, are able to look and say, I have walked with you, you have shepherded me, and I trust you for my salvation. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.